Some say that a memorial is an object to serve as a focus for the memory of something. For me, I believe it's a bit more than that. When I lost my dad a few years ago, I made this plaque to remember him by. However, I was pleasantly surprised to see that every time the sun moved across the sky, different angles of light would shine through my window and hit the plaque, casting moving shadows within its carved lines. It gives the impression of the presence of life. So when I look at it, I not only see my dad, but I feel his presence and his warmth. Now here's a plaque that I made for a client of mine. Notice the nice deep carved lines in the light colored wood. That helps capture those shadows, those moving shadows of life. You want to see how I made it? Stick around. Hey guys, welcome back. I'm Phil. Welcome to my shop. In this video, I'll show you how I take a photo, convert it to line art, and then vectors. Mill up the lumber, carve it out of my CNC machine, shape, sand, and apply my lacquer finish. So without further ado, let's get started. Okay, here's the photograph that I've selected for this project that my client sent me. I crop the image and I turn it into a black and white photo. Then I take that photo and convert it to line art. And I'm gonna convert those vector lines in a program in my iPad. And the app that I'm using here is called Imagine Vector. It's a pretty amazing app and it's free. I simply open up the app and pull in the photograph that I'm gonna use. And once you crop it, it amazingly does its magic. This is one of the reasons why I selected a black and white photo because this program works much better for what I'm using it for. As you can see here, the program has a lot of different filters you can select. This program is also great for anybody that does intarsia work. Now by using these parameter sliders, I can really fine tune my subject. And the goal here is to keep it simple and not too complicated. And I like to shoot for a thicker line. A thick line results in a deep cut on the CNC machine. And this gives me that nice dramatic shadowing that I'm looking for. Once I'm satisfied with those results, I convert it to a JPEG and forward it over to my Macintosh. The program I'm using here is called Aspire. It's made by the Vectric company. This program will convert my line art over to tool paths, telling my CNC machine how to carve out the subject. And this program is very sophisticated. It allows me to tell my CNC machine what to cut and how to cut it. I can also add text, and I can also control the depth of cut. I can even select individual vector lines and manipulate their thickness to result in a better carving. Now for all you folks that are CNC owners and would like to know more about this program and how it works, I encourage you to check out Mark Lindsay CNC. He has some fantastic tutorials on this subject. I'll leave a link in the show notes below. In this area here, for example, I actually deleted some of the lines so I can fit in my text much better. I'll be using two carving bits to cut this project out. A straight end mill bit to carve out this curved line and a 60 degree V bit to cut out the rest. Now this part of the program allows me to open up the tool paths and get a preview of what the piece will look like once it's carved out. At this point, I'll send the picture over to my client to get a final approval. Okay, now we'll head back out to the shop and I'll pull up the program that I just sent to this computer out here. The CNC machine that I selected for my shop is a Stepcraft 600 from Germany. It's a nicely built machine with fantastic customer service. And I pulled the file up and it looks like we're all set. But before we start carving, I need to select some wood. Now I've been holding on to this chunk of maple for quite a while. It's a beautiful crotch burl. I think it's going to be perfect for this project. Just look at that grain. And the exotic wood I'm choosing for this project is going to be Purple Heart. This will be a nice contrast wood to that maple. 
because this chunk of maple is from the crotch of the tree, the grain pattern is going to be pretty spectacular. And as far as the purple heart goes, what can I say? It's purple. Who doesn't like purple? Any type of burl, including this crotch wood, is very difficult on tools. So I set my planer up here to take out 1 32nd of an inch at a time. These sliver cuts will also ensure that I don't get any tear out. Now here at the joiner, I square up one of the sides. And now I trim it to size on my miter saw. And notice how this blade is having such a difficult time cutting this wood. The grain is so tight and hard that it's actually creating smoke from the burning of the wood. It certainly gave this 12 inch newly sharpened blade a workout. And even though I buy my exotic woods already kiln dried and planed, I still like to put them through the planer anyways. When wood sits around, it naturally absorbs moisture in the air. That moisture causes the fibers to swell, creating a slightly rough surface. And back over to my miter saw to trim this one to length. Now this blank of Purple Heart is not quite wide enough, so I simply take a couple of pieces and glue them together. I place two little clamps on the edges where both pieces meet, and this will prevent the piece from getting out of alignment from the pressure of the bigger clamps. I'll let this sit in the clamps for a couple hours. It should be ready after that time. Now that maple blank is much too thick for what I want to use it for. So at my bandsaw here, I'm just slicing off a quarter inch of it. My homemade veneering jig makes this go much easier. And it's much safer than the traditional resawing procedure. I attach the piece to my fence with a side clamp and two flattened screw heads. And one last visit to the planer to flatten out those rough cuts. Now before I bring this piece over to the router, I want to make sure I do a final sanding. If I was to sand after the carving, I could sand away some of the features. And back to the bandsaw to square up the opposite side. Okay, back over to my CNC station. I'm getting ready here to mount the piece to the CNC machine. This is my favorite way of mounting things around the shop. In fact, if you watch my last video, you'll see that I use it there as well. And all you do is apply painter's tape to both adjoining sides. Then you add CA glue to one side and accelerator to the other. And for those that don't know, CA is short for cyanoacrylic glue, commonly known as super glue or crazy glue. Now the CA that I use is a commercial grade made by Starbond. When used with an accelerator spray, it will literally bond both pieces together within seconds. And I prefer this method over physical clamps. I find that they just get in the way of the router. And trust me, it ain't moving. Now let's carve this piece out. As I said earlier, this is going to take two runs. I'm starting here with my 60 degree V-bit to carve out the engraving. This bit is made out of carbide and it has no trouble carving through this hardwood. As I run my tool path, I like to monitor its progress very closely on the screen. If an emergency happened and I had to suddenly stop the CNC machine, this program will allow me to go back and pick up where I left off.
This is a great little machine. It allows me to expand my creativity. It doesn't take up much room in my shop, and it's a lot of fun to play with. On my monitor, the yellow lines are those which were already cut out. Now here I change out bits to a flat end mill bit, and this will cut out the perimeter of the project. The best part of using this CA mounting process is the ability to pop it right off at the end. It's much easier than double stick tape and less messy. Back over to my workbench, I take this soft brass brush and I'll clean out any debris that's clogged in those carvings. Any spots where I have grain tear out, I'll smooth those out with this bristle brush on my Dremel tool. And as you can see here, I neglected to double check the thickness of my piece. Had I given it one more pass through my planer, I wouldn't have to cut out the rest of this on my bandsaw. Now before I mate both of these pieces together, I'm going to run this purple heart through my drum sander. This will make sure that the surface is completely smooth. The glue I'm using here is just regular tight bond. Now here I'm going to show you a gluing tip. Anytime you put glue in between two large flat pieces, they're going to want to move around all over the place. And then once you put your clamps on there, they still want to slip and slide. So what I do is I take regular table salt, just a few grains, not much, just enough in there so when you put both pieces of wood on each other, the grit from those grains of salt will lock both those pieces together. And as you can see here, no more slipping and a sliding. Now over to my homemade press. I made this press for small projects like this, 
as well as multiple veneer blanks for my segmented dizzy bowls. Now back over to the bandsaw to trim off the excess purple heart. Now over to my belt sander, I start the final shaping of this piece. These exotic woods tend to burn easy at sanders. The reason for this is because they have a lot of sugars and oils in them. And for those of you that are cooks, you know that sugar burns very easily on a stove. How to control this is by swapping out your sandpaper. A lower grit sandpaper won't tend to burn as easily as a higher grit. and over to the oscillating drum sander for my curves. You might notice in some of my videos that I use this sanding eraser. It cleans out your sandpaper very well. Although exotic woods are pretty, they sure are difficult to handle in the shop. They not only burn easy, as I just mentioned, but because they have so much oil in them, they clog up that sandpaper like glue. I like to use my orbital sander for flat surfaces, but because they do cut pretty aggressively, I switch over to a non-orbital for any of my curved areas. Once the piece is all sanded smooth and I've got nice, sharp, crisp edges, I then bring it over to my router. Now some genius had the bright idea of setting up his tripod on his router table. All I can say is enjoy the ride. back over to the sander to smooth out those routed lines. I decided to add this little kickstand to my piece. It's just another chunk of Purple Heart. I want the plaque to sit back at a slight angle, so I set my bandsaw at 9 degrees. And that seemed to do the trick. Now here's another gluing tip. As you can see, this little kickstand here that I made would be practically impossible to clamp in place because it's got a big curve on it. So I'm going to use four little dots of CA glue to use as a clamp to hold this in place while that glue dries. And I just put pressure on there for 30 seconds, and that's it. It ain't moving. Now it's time to apply my homemade sanding sealer. It's just a 50-50 mix of denatured alcohol and brushing lacquer. This watery mixture will seep deep into the pores of the wood. This product dries extremely fast, leaving no time at all for any raised grain. 
the lacquer locks them all in place before they have a chance to do so. After allowing that sealer to dry for about 15 minutes, I'll give it a very light sanding with 600 grit. And as I've mentioned in the past, the trick to a beautiful finish is a proper sanding. Now a lot of people hate sanding, but I'm here to tell you, I hate it too. But the results are so well worth it. Now before I apply my lacquer finish, I buff all my pieces with Tripoli first. I like to clean this cotton buff before I do any work. In my hand here I've got a roll of 60 grit ceramic sandpaper. This works great cleaning off all the gunk that might be on my buffing wheel. Now I charge the wheel with buffing compound and again this is Tripoli. It's a very very fine abrasive. Now this procedure shocks many of my colleagues and I can understand why. This Tripoli compound is a waxed base and traditionally you would not apply any wax of any kind on a piece prior to your finish as the wax will prevent your finish from adhering properly. And I practiced that rule of thumb for a long time until one day I made a happy mistake. I had an assembly line of projects that I was doing buffing and spraying and spraying and buffing. Well I mistakenly buffed a few pieces before I even put the finish on. So I wiped off as much wax as I could and uh, just threw caution at the wind and sprayed them anyways. And I was absolutely floored to see how beautiful the finish came out. I love happy mistakes. So here after finishing the buffing process, I just take a soft shop towel and wipe off any excess of wax residue. And as you can see here, this piece already has a beautiful natural finish. Here's my little sanding carousel, and I'm getting ready now to spray the piece with lacquer. This is a homemade mix of lacquer. I mix my lacquer up 18 ounces at a time. The formula is 10 ounces of Minwax brushing lacquer, 6 ounces of lacquer thinner, and then 2 ounces of acetone. And here's the finished project. Notice how the shadow lines are moving when I turn this in different directions in the light. I like to call it the shadows of life. Where did the time slip away? Well that wraps up another video. I really hope you found some value in it. If you learned something today, please leave me a like and subscribe to my channel. And don't forget to ring that bell so you don't miss out on any future videos. Thanks for watching, Exotic Woodworker. I'm Phil DiCarlo, and until the next one, cheers. Yeah.